Hi, I'm Jay from Real Street Performance. Today I'm going to assemble my B20 short block. This is going to get a B16A VTEC head. It'll be a pretty normal, low cost uh, engine that should make around 200 horsepower to the tire and be fun. It's got a factory crank, it's got a SuperTech piston, Brian Crower rod, and a king coated bearing, and all the supporting machine work needed to get the block back to OEM specifications as far as clearances go to have a healthy, happy, long living engine. So that's what we're gonna do today. Uh, first thing we'll do is we'll get the main bearings back in the block, then we're gonna put the crank in. We'll assemble the piston and rods together, get the rings on the pistons, and basically end with a assembled short block. If you're using a factory hardware, you're gonna lubricate all of the friction surfaces. And if while you're installing the hardware, you get any creaking or metallic noises, you know, where you're breaking, you can hear the, the metal on metal friction surfaces. It means that you've got a dry thread and you should stop and re-lubricate your hardware because you're not gonna be able to get an accurate torque spec if you're dealing with uh, dry threads or dry friction surfaces. If you're using an ARP hardware, the problem's pretty non-existent because then you've got their um, ultra torque lube all over the threads and all over the friction surfaces and it's a very smooth transition. But on this engine, we're just using stock uh, Honda hardware. So I have to make sure that everything's lubricated well in order to avoid having a miscalculation on the torque specs. So I'm just gonna run all the main hardware down and seat the caps against the block evenly. You're dealing with a dowel cap, so you wanna be gentle with the dowel that you don't have the dowel cocked over because then it will change shape and be less effective. So you just turn these in by hand and gently seat the cap down onto the block. <laughs> 
crank into the block and with the thick assembly lube, it, the crank does not spin as freely as it did before, but it still spins very nicely. And with the thick assembly lube, the thrust washers that keep the crank from going back and forth in the block, you can still kind of hear them move when you wiggle the crank back and forth. And, and that thick assembly lube is there to keep things lubricated until the oil pump makes oil pressure. It'll also protect you if this thing sits for quite a bit of time, say I break my hand next week and I don't touch this engine for six months. I wanna have everything lubricated so it's not corroding and there's nothing dry. So when it comes to assembly lube, you can use something, a thick fluid or a paste. I use uh, the HPL lube, it seems to work very well. And I'll use that on all the bearing surfaces and all the friction surfaces, and I'll just use oil on the cylinder walls for the rings. But we have a good turning crankshaft. Now it's time to assemble some pistons and rods and move to the next step. These are a full floating type rod. So a, a non-floating rod, you would heat the rod and then push the pin through the piston and the rod. And then when the rod cools back down, it holds on to the pin and the pin only floats in the piston. But this is gonna float in the piston and the pin. So you have to use these circlips to hold the piston pin in place. Very common practice in aftermarket engine parts. And you're gonna wanna be careful when you load those clips in that you don't bend them they have a spring tension to them that you only want to use enough distortion to get them loaded into the piston and then you look at them to make sure they're seated completely and that the pin has a little bit of movement back and forth it just have a very small amount of lash the pin should be able to turn in there freely it shouldn't be loaded up against those clips Now I've loaded the pistons and the rods together. It's a really good time, a super critical time to go back and examine each individual clip that's holding the piston and rod assembly together. If the clip is not totally seated and it falls out, you're gonna have a catastrophic problem. So just take a couple minutes and examine this single step, it's super critical. I've loaded the pistons and rods together with all of the bearing tangs facing the inlet valves of the engine. Uh, there are many different opinions on which way the locks should face. The locks are there to hold the bearing in place during assembly and they don't serve a lot of function when the engine's running. 
This is why there are modern engines that don't have uh, tabs on the bearings at all. It's basically, as the engine's moving down the assembly line, they can quickly load the bearings in and know that they're located correctly away from the crank fillets if that has a large radius crank. If you're dealing with an engine that has two connecting rods that are on a shared rod journal, then the direction of the rod absolutely matters because one set of the rod is gonna be cut for that radius of the outside of the journal and the other side of the rod can be flat to lay on its partner connecting rod. But on an engine like this, that there are four crank journals and four connecting rods and each rod gets its own journal, you don't have to get caught up on which way the bearing tang faces because the rods are not offset in the engine. You do, however, always remember that you're gonna keep all of the caps with their partner rod. I've labeled all the bolts too, that way I can go back. If I take this engine apart in the future, I'll put all the rod bolts back in the same hole they came out of. But the direction of the connecting rod itself doesn't bear a lot of weight, so don't get too caught up in that. Just be uniform in your work. My hands are gooey and sticky from that thick assembly lube, so I'm gonna go wash my hands before I handle the rings. You don't really want any thick oil on the rings because it may not get hot enough to clean off or thick oil may not clean off the cylinder easily. Modern engines have fairly fine hone finishes when they're just using like a production style rebuild like this. So you don't wanna put assembly lube on the cylinder walls because the ring will glide on that assembly lube and it won't be able to scrape it down off the cylinder wall and you'll have a smoking engine. So I'm gonna wash my hands real quick, come back with them clean, handle the rings, and then we can move to putting the rod bearings in the rods and putting the pistons and rods in the engine. Now it's time to load the piston rings onto the pistons. The object of the game here is to do it without distorting the ring. So you don't wanna flex the ring open too far or bend the ring around the piston because it has a memory and it has a shape and we, will, we don't wanna distort that part because then it will affect how the engine seals. So you're gonna be gentle when you're handling the rings. I've kept them packaged in individual boxes. So that way each ring that we filed for each cylinder is gonna go back on that cylinder and none of that stuff is getting mixed up. And I'm just going to wipe each ring off with some light oil before I install it onto the piston so it won't be dry. I'll be using a set of piston ring pliers. This is a pretty basic tool. It hasn't changed in probably as long as I've been alive and they're relatively inexpensive. So if you don't have a set of these, just buy a set. It'll be the, the, the most inexpensive tool you buy throughout this whole process. And it will ensure that you don't bend a ring or break a ring during install. Handling the oil ring isn't nearly as critical as the top or second ring. So those can be kind of moved around a little bit as needed to install onto the piston. If you're dealing with a set of pistons that the piston pin boss encroaches in the oil ring land, then you're gonna have a support rail and the support rails will need to go on first and they're fairly difficult to get on. So we have another video that we've linked to here that you can show you how to install them if you're dealing with a piston that the piston pin is in this oil ring land, but on these it's close, but it's not encroaching on it. So we don't need a support rail. We're just going to install the oil ring as it comes. Each ring has a top and bottom. So you want to ensure that you're installing the rings in the correct orientation. Uh, the second rings on these pistons are what they call a napier hook. So it actually has a sharp edge that scrapes the oil down off the cylinder wall as the piston returns to bottom dead center. And this is a way that they're allowed to get the same amount of oil removed off the cylinder wall with less ring tension. The top ring on this set is just a nitrated steel ring, but both rings have a designation or lettering on the top of the ring to let you know what the orientation is. If you put the ring in upside down, it will pump oil and you'll have to take the engine back apart. So be sure that you're installing the piston rings in the correct orientation and that they move freely around the piston too. If you've got a situation where you go to put the piston rings on the piston and you can't move that ring around freely, stop and figure out why. It won't take much of a problem 
in those very small tight clearance ring lands to create a situation where you've got an engine that has to come back apart. So we've loaded all the piston rings onto the pistons. And if you're a little bit OCD, you can take this opportunity to look at the mark on the top of the ring. So you know the orientation is correct and just make a note on the top of the piston. Same with the other ring. That way, once you've installed the piston in the bore, if you're nervous about this, you know, you've got a lot of responsibility putting your engine together and you want it to be done well. So, if you make little notes as you go, when you get back to a set of steps where you're looking back through a process, you can look at your notes and know that, okay, I did that right because I made a note of it when I double checked it. Because once these parts are loaded together and assembled in one piece, you, you won't really have a cookie trail to follow. So for years and years and years, uh, that's what I did and it kept me out of trouble. So I always check to make sure the rings are in the correct orientation before I move to the next step and if I've made a mistake, I correct it right then. And it's way easier to correct right now with these parts in your hand than when you have these parts in a running engine. Now it's time to load the rod bearings into the rods. We're using a split set. So we have half of an HX or an extra clearance set and half of an H set. So I'm gonna install the HX bearing in the upper housing, which will be the connecting rod side. And I'm gonna have a standard clearance bearing in the cap side. And the reason why we do it that way is so you have additional oil volume on the top side of the loaded side of the rod, heavily loaded side of the rod, because that's where the combustion process is. And you'll have some more oil flow through that area of the bearing housing. Before we load the pistons rods into the block, I need to re-lubricate all of the rod bolts because I took all the lubrication off of them when I was cleaning them. So I just use a small paintbrush and it's the ARP Ultra Torque Lube. And I put it on the threads of the fastener and the under head area. So I wiped the cylinder bores out one last time because while the engine was turned upside down and I dropped the crank in, assembly lube can run up the bores, you know, because gravity is going to pull that oil down. And I want to wipe all that out because I don't, again, I don't want any thick oil on the cylinder walls. So I'm just going to use regular non-detergent 30 weight motor oil on the cylinder walls. That way it's lubricated during initial startup, but it's not so slick that the new rings can't seat in. We need lubrication present so we don't ruin the parts, but we don't want a thick oil on the cylinder walls during break-in. 
We have a ARP a tapered ring compressor here. This is a super handy tool. As you load the piston rings into the cylinder wall, you need to be careful that you don't hang one up as they transition from the tool to the block. And one of the easiest ways to do that is use one of these tapered ring compressors. So you can get the rod lined up and then just with some speed, sling the rod down into the bore past this edge. And depending on how much of a chamfer you have, some cylinder walls are easier to load rings in than others. Most performance engines don't have a very large chamfer like they do coming from the factory. And that's because you have a little bit of a sharper edge where the head gasket meets the head. And some guys think that that will help with gasket sealing instead of a long rolled edge radius at the top of the block. But it makes for a, a little bit trickier situation loading the piston rings. So if you have an old set of ring pliers or a um, uh, collapsing ring compressor, it's best to let that stuff just sit and buy the right size tool for the job. That way you can do it competently and quickly and not have to second guess your work. I've put the piston rings in orientation like this factory service manual, but keep in mind the piston rings are constantly turning when the engine's running. So if you pull an engine apart and all the rings are lined up, don't fret. These parts are in motion while the engine's in operation. But just to avoid any debate on which ring orientation is best, I just put them in the factory orientation and it always seems to work fine for me. Take a second to make sure you have the correct rod cap that you labeled earlier on in the process and that you're lining it up with the lock and the lock facing each other. If you turn the cap around on the rod, you're gonna make a large problem for yourself. Remember when you're dealing with dowels, you want to pull the surfaces together evenly so you don't distort the dowels. So you'll pull the rod cap down a little bit at a time until it's fully seated. I'll bring these rod bolts right to 10 foot pounds and then just go right to the torque spec. When you've torqued the rod down, just give the cap a little shake and make sure it wiggles back and forth. If the cap and rod are stuck where they don't move on the crank, it's time to inspect why. And also if this is your first time doing it, you may do one rod at a time and just make sure that the assembly rotates back and forth freely. If the assembly does not rotate back and forth freely, you have to reverse your steps until you figure out why. Generally, a situation like that is when you've got a rod cap mixed up. I'll move the remaining two journals down away from the cylinder walls and I can install the other two pistons. <laughs> 
time to hit some VTech. Cool. So that's your short block. You can move uh, <clears throat> the crank keyway down. So it's a good opportunity to move all pistons away from the deck of the engine. That way when you're putting the cylinder head on, you don't have to worry about crashing valves and hitting parts. Because this engine is fairly factory in its dimensions, you know, I have a stock stroke, a stock rod length, and a stock compression height. I don't really have to worry about the pistons being too far below the deck or too high above the deck. Either above the deck or below the deck is not an ideal situation. And in order to check that, you can use a very simple tool like this. This one actually came through four piston and you put it on the deck, zero out the dial indicators, and then put it on top of the piston turn the crank until the piston is as high as it can be in the bore. Take the amount from both dial indicators, add them together, divide by two, and that's how far the piston is either in the hole or out of the hole. So there is my assembled B20 short block. And I'm, I'm pretty excited because right now I have a B16A and this is gonna make the engine average better and just be a little bit more enjoyable. I hope that it makes, you know, over 200 wheel and that it fits my expectation and I can do my best to avoid turbocharging it. I say that now, hoping to stick to it. But we'll take this thing off the engine stand. We'll put the front main seal oil pump assembly on, rear main seal housing, get an oil pan on it after we check and make sure that the oil pickup has the correct amount of clearance. And we'll be uh, many steps closer to a running engine. Thanks, hope you've enjoyed this. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. That's why we're here.